Check radio. Check. This is this is Jesse Steele, the most important person in America and in the world. Check. I found a solution to the problem with China. We're gonna we're gonna give Trump a a, a, a Twitter account. That, <laughs> George, hit the record button. You're not supposed to hit the record button while I'm still doing the. Oh, dear. Make sure you cut that out so it doesn't get into the podcast, all right? <clears throat> well, it is I, the, uh, the unteachable one, the, 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 the different, your dear host. And, you know, this week, uh, I just got back from Nam. Oh, boy, there's a, yeah, there's a blast from the past. I never thought I would say that. My dad worked hard to make sure he, you know, when, when the draft was coming, my dad knew that it was, co- my dad had foresight. Where did I get it from? But uh, he knew the draft was coming, and he went... I mean, Dad knew a lot of things. Um, Dad knew that the Great Societies program, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, he knew that that would produce ghettos. It it used to be, um, unfortunately, uh, the the black community, and I mean African-American, I don't mean African, I mean African, you know. Originally, there were these black communities, and they were poor, but they weren't criminal. They had families and you know, family units and it was healthy and they, you know, they were good people and in the communities. And then Johnson came along and threw money at him, paid him to not work, concentrated them down, put pressure on him and stuff. And then now we get all this, the family units gone. No one teaches kids how to, you know, take, take care of themselves and crime went up. And my, my dad saw that coming from Johnson and he also saw the draft coming. So when my father, uh, because my, my dad said, he says, I saw this Lyndon Johnson graces. I knew what was going to happen and it happened. And, and while I was in college, I took dad right into it. We went into Cabrini Green. I took him right in there. He was like, my son's in here. And I'm like, yeah, you foresaw it. Well, my dad foresaw the draft. So he signed up for the MP before the draft came, and he went to Alaska. Nam was the last place he wanted to go. Well, good news for you, Dad. I, when I went to Vietnam, I was there in the north, and it was cold. So, there. We didn't have to worry about the heat. But had a, had a great excursion, and I'm going to write about it in my upcoming blog, probably to be released within a... F- maybe, I don't know when I'm going to get to it. A few months, maybe. I'm going to call it From Asia With Love. But the... The trip to Nam was interesting because I was at the airport and everyone's all, what was it? What was the drama in Hanoi, Jesse? How did you become famous at the Hanoi airport, Jesse? Dude, were you just being yourself? Well, yeah, but specifically, how was I being myself, the most important person in America, in America and in Asia, for that matter? I had printed my e-ticket. I don't like to wait in lines. I don't like to make other people wait in lines. So I, I checked in like you're supposed to on the internet. The airlines are trying to get you to check in before you go. I printed off my, my, my paper, which sounded like this if I held it. And I just, you know, airport security check one. The guy beeps it. Beep. Okay. Funny looking paper, but the code works. You're on the list. That's your passport. Go. I go to immigration. Look at the passport. Okay, you were here so many days. You did what you said you were going to do. All right. Uh, stamp my passport. Stamp the paper I printed on the... On, it's like airplane ticket info on the printer paper paper. And it looks funny. Not your average ticket, but immigration recognized it. Beep, it works. Stamped it with the official government stamp on that paper. Then I go to the, the third security checkpoint where they look at your passport and paper again while you're supposed to take off your shoes and belt and and your pace and stuff. And this lady who running the the thing looked at me like I was some sort of a criminal. And I just stood there and smiled. I'm like, oh, great. Uh, My life. I've had pastors look at me that way before. So I just, she told me to go stand over to the side. So I had my belt there. I took my shoes off. She told me to sit down, which I never sit down when people tell me to sit down. I mean, I mean, I'm going to be on an airplane for five hours. I don't want to sit down. Why, 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 why do they have chairs at the airport? Have you ever wondered that? George, have you ever wondered why they have chairs? You're going to get on the airplane and be stuck in that seat for so long. Why would you want to sit down? 
I don't, some things just don't make sense to me. But, so I'm, so she tells, well, anyhow, she pretty, she raises a fuss. She doesn't like the shape of the paper, obviously. So, you know, pretty soon other people start coming out wearing the airport security. This isn't government. This is airport security, which I suppose in a communist country might be government, but it's, you know, we're not talking official immigration. It wasn't Charlie that was giving me trouble. And, and that was Charlie at immigration. I mean, I saw Charlie. I walked to the airport first. I'm like, oh, it's Charlie. That's VC. But they were nice. They were nice people. It was like, you know, my dad and their dad didn't really like their leaders. It, it, we didn't, you know, so whatever. So all these guys start coming out of airport security, talking on their cell phones, waving my paper around and stuff. And finally, after like 30 minutes, you know, airline guy comes out, takes me down to the airline desk. It happens to be the desk I have a membership card with. I pull out my membership card. They all freak out. The guy's head goes into his palm. Oh, my goodness. We pulled a guy who's, like, so secure. He's, like, got status. So they want my passport, but immigration kept my passport to make sure I didn't go away, which is smart. And then, so I pull out my passport card. Okay, my goodness, this guy's certified. They see all the stamps. They see how often I fly. They're going, what? They're, they're thinking, who who decided this guy was a risk? Who? What? So they gave me a paper that, that, the, that the lady would recognize that everybody else didn't need. And, uh, and that, that was the... It, so I go back through immigration. By now, they're smiling at me, tr- or trying not to smile. They have to keep their regulation frown. I mean, you know, at the border, you're supposed to frown. It's... You're supp- I mean, you're supposed to. It's not a happy thing at the border. So even if they love you, they're there. So they all love the security guards are trying not to, to, to giggle as I walk by. You know, the, the, my dad would have called them security babes, but that was my dad. I won't do that. I call them security guards. So that was what happened at Hanoi. It was a blast. I went through and they all loved me. So I got, got home and emailed mom. Mom, they loved me in Hanoi. So anyhow, this week... Um, so yeah, I did some, I went to Nam this week, uh, interesting story. Maybe I'll talk about it later, but I got a lot of time in the airplane. I know you're going to be so excited to hear this. I'm working on my theology statement. See, I went to Bible school and that means that like, you know, doctors need to read medical journals and engineers need to, you know, read about integrated circuits and stuff and turn them over and look, Ooh, I'm looking at an integrated circuit, you know, like, well, Bible students have to write theology. It just, we have to do it, you know. So I'm, I got work on my, my doctrinal statement done. And I think I'm going to publish it. it it'll be about 50,000 words. Uh, well, depending on how much longer I keep editing, it could get up to a couple hundred thousand, but I hope it'll stop by the time it gets to 50,000 words. Someone asked me today, Jesse, why don't you choose, why don't you chew bubble gum? I said, my mouth doesn't need extra exercise. What was this? All this accusation of Jesse talking too much, and people wonder why I don't chew bubble gum. So I got inspired during this trip. Uh, I really decided that I need, like, I got a vision for getting more blogs going. I really got a vision for getting the From Asia with Love blog going. It's what's going to be premium, and I, I, I just, I, I got, I got a lot of vision for stuff. I think I'm going to blog more. I really think that I'm going to get... I'm excited. It's cool. I'm excited. And I'm really excited. And because I'm, I'm just... I need to get to the point. When you move forward with good work, problems come out of the woodwork. Your boss may object. Your car may break down. People may falsely accuse your motives. Since motives are unseen, no one can prove a motive accusation wrong. But most of the trouble is just getting your would-be allies to understand you. Even friends trying to help will seem to slow you down. Change is an uphill battle. Here's the secret to making it work. Never talk about yourself. Not your effort, your trouble, your goals, your honesty. Just let the proof in the pudding speak for itself. And that's the point. I'm Jesse Steele jessesteel.com